for Advocate for Lives. And we are a youth-led organization that raises awareness for blood and organ donation, as well as health-related research. And we've started this series, e-seminar series, really. And uh, we're doing it so that we can help you guys learn about the different pathways to a medicine and different research and stuff like that, so that you can just really understand what the medical world is about. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Please don't spam the chat. We want to make sure that we're getting all the important questions in on time so we can have Dr. Siri answer them before the session is up. We also want to make sure that everyone makes sure to keep appropriate language in the chat. So no swearing, nothing inappropriate, please. And please keep anything in the chat that you want to ask relevant to the seminar. So nothing about anything outside of the seminar, please. Also, the session will be recorded. You probably got a message about that. And we're only doing that so that we can put it on our YouTube account for anyone who missed it. And yeah, that's pretty much it for us. Yeah, so let's move on to the reason why you all signed up and you guys are here. So today we're gonna to be talking to Dr. Siri, a current emergency medicine doctor living in New York City. And so we will be addressing all of the questions asked through the Google Forms, as well as in the chat at the end of Dr. Siri's presentation. So without further ado, Dr. Siri, please take it away. Hi everyone, um, my name is Siri. I'm a emergency medicine doctor in New York City and I'm super excited to talk to you guys. So I learned that you guys are from Canada and um, mostly give or take uh, in high school. So um, that's really exciting. It's a super exciting time in life and trying to figure out like what you want to maybe do um, for college and beyond. So that's uh, pretty fun. Um, so um, I grew up in the United States. So most of my presentation is going to be tailored to kind of more, more like United States things. But I, I heard that Canada is pretty similar. So you can uh, take from it what you want or the big takeaways and whatnot. Um, emergency medicine is really interesting because in emergency medicine, um, I think there's a huge interface um, between life and death. And uh, I think that whatever your group's mission is in order to kind of uh, raise awareness about organ donation and whatnot, it, it kind of fits into that mold. So um, uh, just an introduction. So I grew up in um, New Jersey, and then I moved to California. I went to school in California, and then I went to school in Georgia, and then went ended up in New York City. Uh, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the United States, but it's pretty big, but then there's big cities. So mostly my life has been um, between Los Angeles and New York City. And both of those are very huge um, metro, uh, metro and politan um, cities with like huge communities and uh, like depth of diversity. So I decided um, sometime during this time that uh, I wanted to try to pursue medicine. So in the United States, um, it's really hard to try to get into medical school. So I tried becoming an emergency medical technician in order to help me fulfill that goal of going at, getting into medical school. And in that way, I got interested in emergency medicine and decided to pursue emergency medicine and go to medical school. So what is emergency medicine? According to uh, the American Medical Association's description, this is a description of what an emergency medicine doctor is. So basically it's um, a doctor that works on anything necessary to prevent death or further disability both outside the hospital and in the hospital, essentially. So we work on evaluation, care, and stabilization of a diversity of patients from birth to death. Um, usually residency in the United States is around three to four years. So a lot of, um, there's a lot of TV shows out there um, that are, that portray <laughs> emergency medicine. Uh, a lot of them focus on the really, really exciting things that happen. I would say that's about like 10, 20% of emergency medicine. Most of emergency medicine is actually just talking to people. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of it uh, is just talking to people about um, their life, the conditions that they have and um, 
basically how that manifests itself. Um, so the other parts uh, that are important. Um, so daily routine, my daily routine is um, pretty interesting. Uh, I do shift work. So uh, when I go in, I get handoff about certain patients um, and I see patients as they come in. I decide to either um, admit them, observe them or discharge them. And uh, if I need to sign them out, I will sign them out. So these are the three things that can pretty much happen to a patient. And then admission would include uh, something like getting a surgery or whatnot. Uh, patient population that I serve, we serve everyone at any time, any day. And this is actually a real picture taken from where I train for residency. You can see that patients are uh, very close to each other and it's pretty packed a space with lots of people trying to, you know, just live and make it. I was asked specifically to talk uh, in this presentation about research opportunities. I think this is a quite an interesting topic because uh, research opportunities uh, offer students in, um, a way to kind of preview a specialty or um, kind of get more experience with the scientific process. As a high schooler, it, I remember being a high schooler. It was, it was very overwhelming. Even like reading a research paper was overwhelming. Uh, and now, and then I went to college and in college, I learned how to maybe read a research paper and get involved with some research. Uh, right now, there are several ways to get involved with research, and those include uh, being in a laboratory, um, doing some clinical work, or uh, doing some virtual work. And I think what's interesting is that the pandemic has um, offered some unprecedented opportunities to be involved in this way. So uh, that being said, um, basically, I think w whatever university you strive to go to, whether that be in Canada or in America, there's always a way to get involved with research, especially if you're eager and you're willing. Um, all you have to do is you just have to email professors and say, hey, I saw that you are doing research and yada, yada, yada. Is there any way that I could be involved? And usually most professors will try to make a space for you in their laboratory so that you can be involved in whatever research is going on. That's how I secured my research opportunities in college. I did go to college like 10 years ago. So I don't think much has changed since then, but in terms of that, but um, it's very competitive usually at, for those sorts of opportunities that are paid. But if you're just trying to do unpaid um, basic laboratory research, the opportunities will be there. Um, there's also virtual opportunities nowadays uh, to be involved with research because some of the research just involves uh, statistics. It doesn't necessarily involve um, being in a particular place at a particular time. Um, so that's actually something else to note. Um, I put this. CDC on here because uh, I don't know if you guys have like a federal administration. I'm just gonna plug in my computer really quick. Um, okay, I don't know if you guys have a federal administration, but if you guys do, you can even contact people at those that like higher level organization to try to get involved with some research. Um, so we have uh, the CDC, we have the FDA, and those are uh, potential places to kind of get involved. Um, I think the most, the most important part about this whole process is, is not that you have to particularly choose the right lab or the wrong lab. It's to choose something of interest to you because you want to learn about it, um, whatever that is. Um, you know, whether it be, um, whether it be like uh, being involved with research involving the brain or the heart or the lungs or even some public health research. Right now with COVID, there is plenty of public health research. That being said, um, I wanted to move on to case studies. 
Um, I remember, like I said, being a high school student, it was a very exciting time in life. Your whole future is ahead of you. And um, I remember being involved in something called the med club in, uh, in high school. And there would be like physicians who come by and talk about their professions. And it right now um, it's impossible, but sometimes they would bring like gadgets to their seminar. Um, and one, one cardiologist, I remember bought his stent with him, like his set of stents so that we could see what that looks like or what, um, ballooning looks like. And that was so cool back in the day. That was like, oh my gosh, like that is so amazing. Like all these different things. It's impossible to do this, do that virtually. But, um, what I can say is that the, just imagine anything that you would go to the doctor for, that's why you would come to the ER. So we have a lot of really cool cases. Um, I encourage you if you're specifically interested in uh, one particular um, aspect of emergency medicine or in medicine, you can like look up a lot of case studies. Um, in New York City over the past year, I think uh, things have changed a lot because I've seen a lot more COVID cases and I know it sucks to talk about COVID again and again. So I don't want to belabor it or anything, but um, I think that that's been a majority of what I saw. And what it made me realize is that a lot of emergency medicine is responding to emergencies. Um, something cool in emergency medicine is that we respond to mass casualty situations. So if you have, for example, September 11th or something like that, that's emergency medicine doctors who are going to be initially triaging those patients, creating a disaster response system, really maintaining like an infrastructure um, for responding to those sorts of scenarios. And I think that that's really a really cool aspect of emergency medicine. Uh, also, emergency medicine is very practical. So I feel like medicine extends beyond the ER. Um, I one time had a patient who thought that they sliced off the tip of their finger. And I, I looked at the patient's finger and I accidentally dropped part of what I thought was the tip of his finger. In the end of the day, it turned out to be a piece of potato. And I asked the patient, why do you have a piece of potato at the tip of your finger? And he said, oh, um, it actually helps with... Um, it helps with clotting the blood. And I was like, really? And um, that was a, a myth in his culture. He was Hispanic. And I looked it up online and put, uh, potato polysaccharides are actually a basis for some hemostatic agents used in surgeries. So I was like, wow, that's so cool. Like, I feel like I know something practical that I can apply in like the real world. Not that I've really tried anything related to potatoes specifically. Um, but I think like having this sort of like knowledge, like, oh, this is what I need to be able to like survive is actually kind of cool. Like if there were ever to be an apocalypse, um, that's, a, that's, I think would be super interesting and super like emergency medicine doctors would probably be the most qualified to take care of anyone in those situations. Um, specifically for organ donation. So how do organs get donated? If you guys think about this practically, uh, organs get donated only when a person dies. And in the emergency department, we have a lot of people who unfortunately do pass away for whatever reason. Um, a specific case would be in cardiac arrest. And emergency medicine doctors, we have a role in kind of, um, situating the patient uh, for a pristine organ donation process if the uh, family chooses to proceed with organ donation. So um, what happens is uh, I, I personally can't say, oh, I want this patient to die because I want to donate their organs. That's not my role or responsibility. I need to do the best I can uh, in order for the patient uh, to make it. But if at any time I feel like, oh, this patient may not make it, I can initiate someone else who's from an outside organization to come talk to the patient's 
family members in the ED and say, hey, look, the situation is really fragile right now. We, the patient might not make it. How can, um, uh, would you like to consider donating the patient's organs if they can't make it? And if the family says yes, at that point, the, um, the people from that organization will be like, hey, this family said they do wanna proceed with organ donation. Um, let's uh, proceed in a certain route. And we have to keep uh, the body at a certain temperature, make sure that uh, we do certain things in order to process that body. Um, some of them are done by the morgue, but some of them have to be done by us. If the patient is COVID positive, they cannot donate their organs. So it's actually really harmful for um, organ the organ donation process, at least in the United States, uh, to have COVID positive patients. And that's why even when people accuse uh, doctors of writing um, death by COVID on death certificates, it's pretty harmful because then that uh, disqualifies that patient from getting a medical examiner, usually in most cases, and in most cases donating their organs. So that's super interesting. Um, and in New York City specifically, this organization is called Live on New York. And you just call this number or your nurse will call this number and then you know they'll start the whole process. So tips for students. So I, I, I do have a few tips for you guys. Um, given that you're in high school, I, I think um, some of these tips uh, really apply to being a pre-med. Um, a lot of you guys uh, probably um, are very ambitious and know that you wanna go to some cool university or awesome university next year and really get a good education and prepare yourselves for um, getting a good medical education. Um, and some of these tips are just helpful. Like you should always be willing to learn new things. Um, even if you don't think it's uh, the most uh, glamorous of things to learn, it's, it's really important to kind of be flexible in the things you learn and the topics you learn about. Make sure you're a team member uh, and participate in any sort of setting that you're in. That's kind of important just to, um, you know, establish yourself as someone who's collaborative. Uh, I would highly encourage you guys to seek leadership opportunities, especially in college, because they will definitely um, bring you courage to do, uh, to lead a team or to, you know, be a certain way in front of other people. Um, leadership can't just be learned from books. It, it must be experienced, I feel. Uh, foreign language is super useful. I really encourage you guys to try to learn um, some sort of foreign language. I know, um, I don't know much about Canada to be honest, but I know in Montreal, a lot of people speak French, for example. And, you know, I don't know, like one of you like decides, I wanna live in Montreal the end of the day maybe France is French is like a super useful language to like know and just like have at the back of your pocket in, like, in case you ever need to communicate with anyone um when you study for anything I don't think you need to necessarily study more hours you just need to study more effectively figure out what makes you successful so some people study for hours and hours and hours and at the end of the day they don't make the cut for some grades. You need to figure out what you need to study and how you need to study so that you don't waste all your time on studying and you can actually enjoy your life. Um, there are ways to learn things in shorter periods of time. If you figure out that if you're a visual person or a, um, a verbal learner or a written learner or whatever, like, I would figure out um, a, or discuss and kind of tr trust trial like what works for you so that when it comes to college, you guys are able to be really successful. Um, more tips, um, I would find good mentors. What that means is not necessarily the ones that are the most famous or the most popular or anything. It's, it's really like people who are invested in you and your future and also, people who um, who may be the kind of person that you want to be in the future. Like you see someone and they're doing, I don't know, like 
they're a rheumatologist and your dream is to become an expert rheumatologist and be a pro joint injector for arthritis and cure it all over the world. And you found someone who's doing exactly that. Try to talk to that person and reach out and find out more about their own path so that you can formulate your own path um, to, to medical school and beyond. Uh, do not lie. <laughs> I know it's really tempting to say, oh, well, I did all these amazing things when maybe you didn't do those things. Uh, people will find out. Uh, I remember after I graduated high school, someone at my high school decided to put down something really simple, like they were the president of, I don't remember, it was like the American Red Cross or something like that. Very soon, uh, one of the Ivy League institutions figured out that he was not, in fact, the president of that particular club and then banned all the students from that high school in order to get into that university. So don't be that person. Um, I think that truly, if you've invested in something, it will show, there'll be things to show for it. Um, you will fail a lot uh, and the failure will make you stronger, I promise. Uh, sometimes it's hard to accept when things don't always go the way that we want them to go, but sometimes that's kind of the, the only way that you'll be successful is that that had to happen in order for you to go in the path that you needed to go in. Hard work shows. So um, I know you guys are like really investing in your futures. You're here, you're trying to shadow on a weekend and that's awesome. Like continue working hard and continue learning from other people. And lastly, what goes around comes around basically don't don't you know be the kind of person that you would never hang out with uh, be the kind of person that you would want to surround yourself with and i think that's going to be really important lastly I, I i feel like this is really cheesy but honestly like do what makes you happy um you know some people like regret it like very small things like oh i didn't go to i don't know prom or i didn't do this or i didn't do that and those are the kinds of things that, you know, will have, will make memories for you and bring you, lift you up in the times that you're truly down. Um, and you need those sorts of memories in order for you to continue to um, go down the path that you need to go down. So you need to do what makes, brings you alive because so much time can pass where you're just in a book and you're like, oh man, all I've been doing for the past seven days is studying. And it's okay to do some fun things once in a while. Don't just be that person. Like, it's okay to engage in a social life and do those other things. So that's important. Um, and uh, this is how to reach me. Um, I know my presentation was kind of short, um, but I, Thought I'd keep it relevant for you guys, and I find that um, the questions that you guys have are often better than whatever <laughs> I usually have to share. So, um, if you scan this QR code, you'll go to my link tree. You can find me on IG, Twitter, or uh, you can look at my blog. It's from a few years ago. It's actually it actually kind of chronicles my life in medical school from the first day to when I started rotations and kind of goes through some of the um, rotations that I had or the things to look forward to when you ultimately decide to pursue medical school. And that's all for me right now. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that was a really informative uh, seminar. We learned a lot about organ donation and research. It was so cool. But yeah, you guys signed up and we gave a section for questions and you guys have a lot. So we're going to go through those. And if you have any other questions, just feel free to put them in the ch chat. <clears throat> so one of the questions we got was about the education of being an emergency doctor. So they're wondering that if they decided to pursue a PhD and then apply to med school, would the type of, would the uh, name of the college that they get their PhD from have an impact on where they get hired or their uh, med school application? Mm. 
I have a question for you guys. Do you guys have Shark Tank in Canada? Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there's this guy from Shark Tank who's like kind of a mega star. Um, his name is Mark Cuban, right? And I like to use him as an example because it's just kind of interesting to me, like um, where people come from. Mark Cuban went to Indiana State University. And by no regard is Indiana State University like Harvard. It's like your local state school. It does not matter where you get your PhD, honestly. And it will not, um, it more matters the strength of the actual program for that. So say like the best, I don't know, you really want to get your PhD in microbiology and the best microbiology program in the entire country is in Buffalo. Then go to Buffalo, like, or go wherever. It doesn't matter. Like, it really doesn't matter as long as you are able to really prove that this PhD made a difference in your career. Um, and you're able to kind of show that it helped you grow in a certain way. Usually with PhDs, uh, there is an expectation to publish. And the way that um, schools are ranked are based on how many papers or how many publications or how many grants they get actually. Um, so the more grants they have, that means they usually have more opportunities uh, for, uh, or more money uh, in certain studies already. So that shows that, oh, there's already like researchers here doing certain things. Um, but uh, beyond that, it's never, it's never impossible to go somewhere from, you know, the local institution or whatever. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Or PhD you. or med school or whenever. <laughs> okay. So moving on to our next question, uh, someone asked, what do you do um, and what options are there for postgraduate education like fellowships? Uh, postgraduate education would be after medical school. Yeah. Okay. So after, so medical school is a really like open-ended book, right? And then you get to write your next chapter and choose um, residency after medical school. And there are tons of residencies out there. The most popular ones are internal medicine, pediatrics, uh, emergency medicine, ob and surgery. I would say those are probably like the five most popular specialties to go into after medical school. I mean, there's also multiple more like neurosurgery, neurology, you name it, there it's out there. Um, beyond that, after you train initially in residency, then you can do a fellowship in uh, different um, things in your field. So let's say you decide you wanna become a cardiologist. So first you would have to go to internal medicine residency and then you would pursue a fellowship in cardiology. So a uh, residency is usually uh, three or four or five or six or sometimes seven years if you're doing neurosurgery. And um, if you're doing a fellowship, usually it could be one to three years. And I think cardiology is either two or three years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And we have another question. <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned the reality of being an emergency medicine doctor, but uh, could you talk a little bit about the work-life balance in this field? Sure. Um, I get asked this question a lot. <laughs> and I think it's, uh, it's interesting because um, emergency medicine is different from other fields of medicine. Uh, when you usually think of what doctors do, they have patients on their schedule and you see patients on your schedule, or you have patients on your OR list and you uh, go do surgeries on those patients. Uh, with emergency medicine, it's an open book and a new chapter every single day. Some chapters are short, some chapters are long. So you walk into the ED, it could be busy or it could be completely empty. You never know. Uh, it's just how people, it's like people, you know, the, the cool thing is you never have to recruit your patients because people will always need emergency room services uh, throughout their life. Um, in terms of work-life balance, um, I think that makes a huge difference because I don't spend out time outside of work necessarily recruiting people or scheduling people. 
I just spend time outside of work, maybe learning different things about my field. And um, I think that makes a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. Also, there's uh, I like I like to have um, time where I'm not interrupted. I'm never on call. No one ever like calls me outside of um, work hours in order to be like, hey, this is your patient. Um, what kind of, uh, like, can you tell me more about this patient? Because usually I meet people once or twice, hopefully just once <laughs> and treat them. And then I never see them again, hopefully. Um, but, uh, that's, that's cool because once you're done with work and you leave work, you don't, you don't like need to necessarily like do those kinds of things for your patients. Um, and that way, like when I'm off and I'm at home, I'm off and I'm at home. I'm not like still in work mode or not expecting anyone to call me about work, uh, which I think is great. Um, I specifically dedicate some of my time to do things that I enjoy truly. Um, I enjoy a lot of different things. I love uh, working out. I love exploring New York City and eating. And these are all things that make me come alive uh, outside of emergency medicine. They just bring happiness to my life. So I do them. Mm -hmm. um, you need to figure out what makes you happy. Is it like painting? Do you like reading? Do you like running? You know, whatever it is that you like doing, make time for it because life is too short. Honestly, you're going to you're gonna regret it if you just like go through high school and you don't do one dumb thing honestly. Uh, I promise you. Okay. Maybe you won't, but like I would have. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Thank you. So more specific to the situation currently we're living in, what are the, some of the challenges that you face during the pandemic and you continue to face? I think there's a lot of challenges that we face, um, especially being uh, frontline workers and being the first point of contact for a lot of the patients who even come to the hospital. So the way hospitals work is that um, patients usually come to the emergency department and from the emergency department, uh, if they're really, really sick, they uh, stay at the hospital. And that's like around 90 to 95% of patients usually, even more sometimes. Uh, very rarely do patients get admitted to the hospital in any other way, like, you know, outpatient through like surgery that went wrong or something like that. It, it's usually through the emergency department. So we see pretty much everyone that has to stay at the hospital. Um, in that way, uh, we face a huge burden for resources in order to care for a lot of the people who are really, really sick. Um, we make a lot of very important decisions, like do they need um, life-saving treatment? Um, do they need uh, to be placed on ventilators or whatnot? Um, so we have the opportunity to really change people's lives. And I think that makes a huge difference um, to, to our life. Uh, as from before, where we still made these decisions, but uh, there wasn't one specific disease that was so life-threatening that, you know, people could bring home to their families without them knowing. And I think that that's something that has really shaped the care that emergency medicine doctors have been providing over the past few, uh, few months and almost year now. Um, we always have to wear PPE. We are putting our lives at risk every single day. So that's why I am immensely grateful for this vaccine. So such that like, you know, at, at least offers some, us some level of protection. Um, a lot of doctors are faced with a dearth of PPE, meaning personal protective equipment like masks. Um, you know, that's definitely something that physicians are facing across the country now more so or less so than before. And then hospital systems, um, whenever there is a surge in certain areas, do get overwhelmed. So there's also that situation. Um, and unfortunately, when hospitals get overwhelmed, just the system, that, the thing that I talked to you about, like where a patient comes to the emergency department and then usually they're admitted to the hospital and then they go somewhere in the hospital. 
when there's nowhere in the, else in the hospital to go, guess where they stay? In the ED. And then if patients continue to stay in the ED, that eventually there's no more space in the ED too. And then they're in the waiting room. And then from the waiting room, there, there's literally no space in the hospital. So it's, it's very, it's very, very hard to treat people um, when you're not, when you don't have those kinds of resources available too. And I think that that's something that's been a long-term issue. Yeah, for sure. We definitely understand that. So speaking about all of this, would you ever say it was too hard to handle all that? Like all these life and death situations happening every day, especially during this pandemic, does it ever get too much for you? And if so, what do you try to do to calm down and get through the case? I think it's uh, really important to um, really important to have a good community. Uh, it's definitely it's definitely overwhelming for anyone, even the most experienced of physicians, right? Um, because there's never been anything like this in our lifetime. The last thing, last time something like this happened was the Spanish flu of nineteen um, oh eight or eighteen or something. It's basically where. Um, that I think it was 1918. Basically, at that time, what they did when their hospital systems were overwhelmed, you know what, you know, students, volunteers, what their duty was when people were placed on um, on uh, breathing machines, it was to physically stand there and compress the airbag for hours on end. And that was the duty of the medical students and volunteers and all those people who came by and that was in 1918. And honestly, if there's no vents, then you can't people place people on machines, you know? And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting because that's the last time such a thing has happened. Um, and now physicians just think about how many lives were lost from the Spanish flu and how many lives unfortunately were already taken from us, from our current, uh, our current uh, pandemic. Um, in order to kind of stay sane during all of this, I think it's important to have an outlet, you know, whatever that may be. Uh, to me, I joke around with my friends or I have a very supportive family and everything. So I don't, I don't feel like um, there's necessarily no support ever. And the people that I work with are fairly amazing. So I can always have a, a great, great um, thing. Yeah, yeah, that's sure. great. Um, on a lighter note, what do you think is like the strangest or weirdest case that you've seen? Uh, this is a hard one. We see a lot of weird things in the ED. Uh, I could tell you about a case that was published actually um, in one of the journals. Um, so a, a woman came in um, with uh, with, um, like some sort of like, uh, deficit in her neurological exam. So basically, um, when we worry about like someone having a headache or anything, this woman came in with a headache and then, uh, her eye was like pointed down and out and we were like, Oh, this is like such a strange, uh, strange presentation what's going on and usually that's related to one of the cranial nerves um which are which is one of the nerves um that uh basically works in her brain in order to perform a certain operation um so basically like we were like oh my god what's going on oh my god what's going on and my friend saw this case and um this woman ended up having air in her brain and that's not normal. So usually the brain, um, you're supposed to have bone, your skull, uh, your actual brain, so like tissue, and some fluid around the brain, CHCSF. Uh, air in the brain is not a good thing and also very strange, actually. So where did this woman get air in her brain, right? That's what you begin to wonder, like, did she you know, have some sort of trauma, like no trauma. Uh, uh, when um, providers perform analgesia or providers give anesthetic for um, pregnant women like a C-section, they perform something called an epidural. 
so this woman had an epidural for some reason, not for a C-section, but like for some reason. And that's how the air tracked all the way back from her spinal cord into her brain and caused these symptoms. So I thought that was a pretty cool case and it was published in one of the um, neurological magazines. So that's, um, that's something like, like I said, we see all sorts of things in the emergency department, so. Mm. Wow, that's really interesting. I never thought that could happen, wow. Yeah, but, like lots of complications of um, yeah. very, uh, so, like very easy things. We also see like very benign uh, actions being taken to the extreme. Like some people, um, when they chew food, um, they're, they swallow it and sometimes food gets stuck in their mm -hmm. esophagus and literally it's stuck there. It's not like they're choking because it's not, it's, stuck. Their, it's not in their trachea. So that would be choking or that would be like mm -hmm. a, it's, it's called a food impaction. And for, even for cases like that, we have to we have to put a tube in their throat and then the GI doctors have to come down with their fancy like long um, uh, camera tubes and then come go in their throats and like grab the food and pull it out and they'll pull out all sorts of big food <laughs> and then you'll be like uh yeah so you need to chew before you swallow <laughs> yeah I just remember to chew guys uh, um, the journal you mentioned do you remember the name of that journal I don't remember. Oh, okay, no worries. Um, our next question is about what is the most challenging thing you faced during your journey to med school and to becoming an emergency doctor? And how did you overcome it? What is the... So one, I think, big, big challenge that I faced um, that may be a challenge to some people in this group, may not is I didn't really have a lot of um, people who I knew in medicine necessarily uh, that were, I was related to, or I had like an in with, you know, like close family, friends, yada, yada. So I think a lot of um, American institutions, I didn't realize this, like were requiring like shadowing or uh, would require you to uh, complete a certain number of hours with the physician or yada, yada. Um, I didn't know a lot of doctors. <laughs> And it's really strange because then I just started emailing random doctors and then doctors would just be like, no, like it's against HIPAA, like no. Oh. Um, what, I, what I learned is that it's actually really like for the people who do have other um, like people in medicine, it's actually like so much easier for them than it is for people who don't. Because um, what they could do is be like, hey, dad, I, I want to go shadow you. Or, hey, mom, like, can, can you ask your friend if I can go? Um, you know, it's like really hard, you know, um, to kind of break into that uh, community or be um, at a level where you have those sort, sorts of opportunities. Um, how I recommend, uh, like, you guys, it's really hard. Everything is virtual this year. So that's a good thing because then there's a like lower expectation that you're doing those sorts of things. And then it's all, it also makes it harder to form in-person connections. Like let's say you volunteer at a hospital. That's a good way to make a connection with like doctors or staff there, or even like nurses to like see if there's any opportunities for you to take that volunteering position and turn it into a shadowing position on some days or whatnot. Um, I think like I definitely got some experience kind of shadowing some people through my volunteering work in high school. Um, other ways uh, is actually to start, um, you could just like mass email people. It's hard, but during this pandemic, most people will probably still say no. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes, hey, listen, you never know what's gonna happen until you try. And the worst that could happen is they say no. <laughs> and then you move on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, you had nothing to lose um, from that. Uh, so I think that was my biggest obstacle. Um, and I feel like uh, because I went through this process, it was easier for me to encourage other people that I knew who were going to this, through this process uh, kind of and help them out so that they don't make the same mistakes that I do. 
Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so the next question is, what is a pitfall or like the worst thing about being in emergency medicine? I think a pitfall is definitely uh, you don't have long-term connections with your patients. If that's something really, really important to you, then emergency medicine is not for you. Most patients uh, you'll meet like in two seconds, you'll talk to them for however many minutes and then you may never see them again ever. And also you will never with certainty know a lot of diagnoses. So you just have to be okay with saying, hey, I don't think you're having anything life-threatening going on right now but I actually don't know what's going on. You know, like if someone comes in with a, I'm making this up by the way, if someone comes in with a giant watermelon sized uh, wart on their chest one day, uh, in emergency medicine, we'll make sure that the wart isn't um, an infection. It's not something dangerous or causing you to have any some, something dangerous going on. And then we'll go, Nah, I don't know what the word is. Um, so here's a dermatology referral. Maybe they can figure out what the word is versus an in internal medicine. Uh, they'll really try to probe and be like, so was the wart structure uh, globular or was it flat on top? And um, maybe we should order these 15 lab tests in order to test if it's this wart versus this wart. And if it's not this wart, then maybe we can consult another team and figure out what kind of wart it is. And that's like, I think a huge difference because we're just saying, hey, I just don't think it's anything that is within my scope of practice, which is an emergency, but I still don't know what it is. Maybe out of curiosity, I'll look it up. But in terms of... Um, in terms of my job, it would be more like, oh, okay, it's not dangerous. It's not life-threatening. I don't think this person is in imminent danger at this moment, but they definitely need to go to get checked, get it checked out. Maybe with someone who's more of an expert in that field than I am. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, another question we got was how do, uh, how does the irregular sleeping patterns that happen because of the night shift affect the health of emergency doctors and doctors in general? I think uh, in emergency medicine, it's really tough um, because you do switch between days and nights and nights and days and whatnot on a regular basis. Um, but I think like uh, there are studies that show that you can actually adapt the schedule to a circadian pattern as well to make it more natural. And also um, it does contribute to burnout in the field. You need to truly find um, kind of a schedule that works for you and how that works for you. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And like, even with the difficulty of night shifts, like what kept you motivated to go through this long and difficult process of becoming a doctor in any country? And are you glad now that you took this path? Are you like happy with your career now? I'm pretty happy with my career. <laughs> uh, I think like what kept me motivated is you really have to like, like the actual job. So like I said before, um, it's not really that glorious. Like doing CPR isn't that glorious. It's actually like really hard to do it effectively and well and for such a long time. And also to make a meaningful impact with the actions that you're doing because some people with CPR just won't survive no matter how long you do it. Um, and you really have to get satisfaction from the things that happen more often. Like, hey, I just counseled this person on, I don't know, not, not like chewing their food and not getting food boluses stuck in their throat. And you know what? They were like, hey, you know what? I really need to consider doing this next time. And actually that might have been more life-saving than the CPR that you just did. So it's just like getting um, satisfaction from the small things and enjoying your interactions um, on a daily basis, whether they are something that, um, you know, they, they, they need to bring you to life. And for me, uh, I've always been pretty, um, pretty open to interaction 
Uh, and I really enjoy getting to know people's stories and where they come from. And I think that's what motivates me to continue uh, learning and growing in my position. And I really have a opportunity to use their stories to like create a better future for maybe not just them, but for other people. And that like really takes your um, ability to make a change from one patient to a population. Yeah, that sounds amazing, actually. Um, so I know we saw that you had like a couple of tips in your presentation, but do you have any specific advice for students who like are thinking of being in the medical or healthcare field, but they're unsure if they want to be a physician or like go more into research? Do you have any tips for them or any kind of like pathways that would be a good option? I, what I would do is to shadow both people or if they can't shadow, then uh, try to really figure out what a day in the life is. Videos on YouTube, yada, yada. Like what is a day in the life of a researcher? Uh, what is a day in the life of a, a doctor? Uh, what is a day in the life of a PA, NP? Uh, I don't know, like a nurse, like whatever ancillary, um, you know, fields you can think of, you know? and try to figure out if they can imagine self, themselves in the day in the life of that particular profession. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So another question we have is like, in terms of being an EMT during undergrad or even in med school as well, would you say that's helpful when you're applying to med school applications and helpful in general to understand the emergency medicine field better? I do think it's really helpful because it will not get not only get you exposure to patients, but it will also pay most EMT jobs pay. So um, it's like a double whammy. Um, also, but it's I mean, it's hard, like you, you have to be willing to put in the work in terms of like, um, doing it. But like, I think that it is helpful um, as a activity, um, in order to get into medical school, and it'll also give you an edge about the way our medical system in America already works before you get there, because you'll already know like, Hey, okay. Would you say it's. Oh, I was going to say like, um, yeah. Oh, like someone comes to the hospital, how, or like you're, if you're an EMT, you see them being transferred to the stretcher, what sort mm -hmm. of actions the doctors are taking, um, what they're kind of doing initially or, um, what they want you to know or what things, um, keep a patient alive. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you get to treat some simple things as an EMT, you get to treat like anaphylaxis, you get to treat um, hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. Like these are very simple things, but it'll teach you to recognize certain things and um, see where patients are coming from. You get to pick them up at their, you know, place of residence or whatever. So mm -hmm. would you say it's like at the same level as a being a scribe I think that's what it's called like a hospital scribe because lots of there are um, different uh experiences mm -hmm. so an EMT is a emergency medical service person so it's uh, a technician sorry um so they are kind of a um they work in behalf of like the pre-hospital system in order to actually care for patients and transport patients from uh the 911 call that they arrive on to the hospital. Sometimes mm -hmm. they work in hospitals too, but rarely. That's mainly their job. A scribe is a, not a clinical really role. It's more you're writing notes for a doctor. They're telling you what to write or you're witnessing a patient yeah. interaction and you're typing. So it's very different. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the explanation. I actually wasn't sure what an EOT was, so that was really helpful. Um, so next, someone was wondering if there's any specific research institutions or college websites that you know of in which you, they can get involved in like online? Mm, I don't, unfortunately. I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty removed from that. Um, but I would definitely do your search on Google, maybe even seeing if there's any programs through the um, colleges that you guys are interested in attending in the future, seeing like, I don't know, like a research program, whatever the name of the college is, you know, 
um, Toronto College Research Program. I don't know, like, you know, kind of getting, um, doing that and then just really looking through. Honestly, I'm not, I'm not very familiar at all. Of course, no worries. Um, we have another question regarding what you think are the qualifications for a good um, ER doctor. Not a lot of people can do emergency <laughs> medicine. Um, I think they are qualifications for being a good doctor in general and also being a good person. Um, you have to be uh, very uh, flexible, being able to think on your feet uh, being able to work as part of a team, but also being a team leader, um, and, uh, not panicking in the face of crisis, because that's, uh, truly what, you know, you're, you're there to show leadership, um, to the rest of your team if something goes downhill, and that's really what's important. Um, also showing compassion, advocating for your patients, I don't know, the list could go on and on, but <laughs> those are some of the important qualities of a good ER physician. Thank you for answering that. Um, so the next one is what are the expectations, if you know, for PAs in the ER? Um, PAs are physician assistants, um, or but they practice independently um, in some situations. They work in urgent care, uh, sometimes they see uh, lower acuity patients by themselves. Um, I personally feel like there's really, it's really hard question to answer in terms of expectations, but they graduate with licensure um, in order to be able to practice in lower acuity settings. And they're all also able to work directly with physicians with higher acuity patients. Awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, I, don't know. I think we have... Yeah, uh, we have one last question regarding, it's kind of weird and a little weird, but basically, what do you think the scope is for IMGs in emergency medicine? Like, how hard is it to get into that field? Is it easy for them to transition and all of that? Mm. From what you know? From what I know, if you look at uh, the NRMP website, uh, emergency medicine is predominantly an AMG dominated field. Um, a lot of American medical, medical graduates will secure a majority of the spots um, in the specialty. A majority, I think over 80, maybe even over 90% of the spots. So that's pretty, pretty difficult to secure a position as an IMG. That being said, it's not impossible. Um, the face and the future of emergency medicine is um, changing. So it might be that, you know, it changes sometime in the future and um, other people are able to uh, secure spots more easily um, because there's more programs or there's more training available. Uh, I'm, I'm personally not really involved with that, but I feel like you should just continue to monitor the numbers from NRMP uh, once the time comes. And most of you guys are in high school, so you still have around eight years before any of this or seven years before any of this really goes down. So you have a long time and a lot can change in seven years. For sure. Okay, yeah, so that's all for our questions today. So thank you so much, Dr. Siri, for giving us this presentation and answering all the questions our participants had. No, thank you so much for having me. Um, I hope you guys found this session useful and you learn something and um, you can always um, message me or email me or whatever and I'm happy to answer any sort of questions that you guys have and I think all of you guys have a lot of talent and have a lot of ambition and I hope that uh, you find much success. Thank you. But before we end this session off, for any of you guys who are interested in getting volunteer hours, um, so the way it's going to work is that we're going to be posting a Google form, which will act as a quiz sometime tonight. And you'll have about a day or two. We'll explain it all in the quiz. And essentially, if you can pass with more than 50%, we will be sending you a certificate that for most schools, it should be enough to validate that you did uh, 
do this session and that you do deserve that volunteer hour. If it does not work, you should definitely talk to your school about it. We've talked to as many as we could and for them it is acceptable, especially during the pandemic. Uh, so it will be posted on, in our bio. So if you guys aren't following us already, uh, Faith already just posted it. It's Advocate for Lives on Instagram. Everything is going to be there. You will have a certain amount of time to do the quiz because we need to send out the certificates. Um, as well, we will be including Dr. Siri's uh, presentation in a Google Drive, which we'll post after the quiz is over. So if there's any last minute questions, that you can definitely put them in now. Otherwise, we're pretty much at the end of the seminar. Yeah, we just had one last uh, question. So if someone asked, if one becomes an ED doctor, can they choose to stick to only day shifts or night shifts without constantly having to switch? Uh, it's really hard to stick to only day shifts because that's what everyone would want, right? Um, but certainly there are positions uh, where you could be a nocturnist only and work night shifts. Oh, right. nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Good luck, thank guys. You so yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Take care, okay? Good luck. Bye. Bye. Uh, how do I stop this? <laughs> Get me on.